Our Heavenly Father, how great is salvation you've given unto us in your Son. How greatly you've blessed us with your common graces as well as those special grace that's available only in Christ. We thank you and we praise you for this blessed season in life, in your church, in your church's history. We have access to your word. We can meet freely, at least here, where we can declare your truth and speak freely about your love, about your sacrifice for us, and about the hope that you give us for the future. Please, O oh Lord, be glorified in this morning's study and in our service and in the week yet to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Today we move on to a new series. We're going to take a break from Matthew and go back and reiterate um, our mission statement. We began this year with a mission statement. You've probably gotten used to seeing it so much so, right? When you see a slide a bunch of times or anything a bunch of times, you just stop looking at it all together. But that mission statement was specially crafted to design or set us with an idea of where we're going, where, where the leadership of this church sees our uh, importance and our place in the wall of the body of Christ throughout Fort Collins and throughout the world, and what we're meant to be doing. And we would ask and hopefully ask why we need a mission statement to begin with, right? We would very you know, plainly say our mission statement, one uh, pastor quipped when asked for a constitution, he said, you're holding it, right? You're holding your Bible. And that's an adorable thing to say. But the reality is, is that there's a lot of Bible here, right? And so what we need and what, we, what is helpful to us as we move forward as a body and has been help through, helpful throughout all the church's history to take the key information from the Bible and understand and distill that into uh, what we essentially believe or our core beliefs so that we don't, um, we don't have to be in the position of saying, yeah, just believe everything in here exactly as I believe it, exactly as I see it. But we can distill those down to some ideas. This has been a common feature in church history throughout, I mean, the very earliest stages of the church, people were designing and writing confessions, right? Confessions and creeds that were essentially just attempts to try to get down to what the central information of the Bible is that we can gather around as Christians. In other words, where do we need to have absolute unity? Where can we have a little bit of liberty and, and um, grow in our understanding together or as we grow in our understanding together? And so, in our modern church context, that has led us to the mission statement, or sorry, the, uh, the doctrinal statement, and most churches, at least any church worth its salt, will have a doctrinal statement, a statement that tells you what they affirm, what they believe, what the non-negotiables of that group are, and hopefully that mission state or that doctrinal statement is also built upon the Word of God. However, a doctrinal statement, is, which we'll look at ours in a moment, is also a rather long and should be a, at least a reasonably in-depth document that points out and puts the boundaries on what it means to be a part of this church and what you're uh, getting, if you like, when you walk in the door and when you take part of this local church body. A mission statement, on the other hand, is the sleek these are the things that we're centrally about. These are the priorities that we take. And so that's where we've uh, see, sought after crafting this, and we want to go through a review process and see how are we doing? Are we living up to our ideals? Are we living up to the goals that we've set for ourselves for this year and following? And um, are our priorities in theory matching with our priorities in action. So that's the design of coming back and revisiting this series, which we started or began in January. Um, and um, I want to begin truly by affirming our doctrinal statement. I didn't write this doctrinal statement. It was in place before I got here. I think we might have made a couple of tweaks to it along the way. But it's an excellent, I think it's actually very well balanced. The doctrinal statement is not meant to be so specific that everybody's left outside but the pastor and his two best friends. And yet it's also not to be so open that anyone could come in regardless of their attitude about the Bible or Jesus Christ or anything and say, yeah, I 
I identify with this church. Like, um, again, and I would also point out that the, the doctrinal statement is not meant to say that if you don't believe all these things, you can't be here. By all means, if you have questions about these things, we want to talk about them and, and grow through them. But this is sort of a, a, a great starting place for all of our discussions about the church, what the church che- teaches, what the church believes, and we put it in writing and we put it on our membership covenant so that you recognize that you're knowing what you get when you come in the door right? Um, So, uh, the doctrinal statement starts with the most important uh, starting place it can have, which is the Scriptures. I'm just going to read this to you. We're not going to comment on it a lot today because it's not the purpose of our our, uh, message, but it is important that we remind ourselves what we've decided to gather around, that we remind ourselves what it is that we hope to uh, affirm as a group, and if we do have questions about it, to be able to ask them rather than uh, just as one church that I heard of who had a wonderful doctrinal statement. And uh, my friend went up to the pastor of the church and said, you have the best doctrinal statement I think I've ever read. He said, yeah, but nobody believes it. I mean, we're just too lazy to change it. They'd they'd long since liberalized and left the Word of God far behind. Um, And so we want to keep this document in front of us so that we can say, do we need to change this? Is is this what we're, is this an accurate uh, summation of what we teach and believe here at Fort Collins Bible Church? So it starts with the Scriptures. We believe that all 66 books of Scripture are God-breathed authoritative, and without error in the original manuscripts. We believe in a literal or normal interpretation of the Bible in light of the historical context and proper grammar. As much of this is the uh, context or or topic of today's message, we won't uh, elaborate on that just yet. Next, number two, we believe in the Trinity. We believe in one God who has revealed Himself as three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, each distinct from each the other, but equal in attributes and essence. So we believe that God exists in eternal trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, sharing one essence, distinct in person, but equal in attributes. Uh, Satan and demons. We believe that Satan is an angel in rebellion against God, and demons are angels who have followed him in his rebellion. We believe Satan and his demons are active in the world today. While this might not be a popular uh, doctrine to affirm, especially in today's world where uh, the doctrines and the belief in angels and demons have largely been considered passe, we recognize that the Bible is unquestionable in its forthcoming nature about these spiritual realities and these spiritual beings that we don't have uh, direct or regular interaction with, and that they're an important part of shaping this uh, conflict between Satan and uh, the rebellious angels and God's holy angels is meaningful to us and important for us to understand the larger scope and picture of what's going on. Article 4, man created and fallen. We believe that man was created by God as a human being and did not evolve from a lower order of life. We believe that man was created in the image of God and that he fell through disobedience and, as a consequence of his disobedience, gained an inner desire for sin. We believe all people are born into this world as sinners and are, apart from salvation in Christ, lost and hopelessly doomed to eternal destruction as a consequence. So again, this is a central affirmation when it comes to our biblical anthropology. We believe that just as the Bible has said that man was created in God's image uh, by God forming the body out of the clay of the earth and breathing His Spirit into that, uh, that life form, that, that, that clay shell, thus making mankind in His own image. We did not, uh, yeah, we affirm the biblical account, and hopefully we see how this all flows naturally from the first article, our belief that the Scripture is the final authority for all life and practice. Moving forward, we have the first advent. We believe that God the Son, Jesus Christ, was conceived supernaturally by the Holy Spirit and born naturally to Mary. We believe that He lived a sinless life and died for sin on the cross. The simple uh, reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ is central to what we believe. It is the cornerstone of our faith and our belief of how a person is forgiven and reunited to God, not through our works of righteousness, but through His perfect sacrifice and provision for us in Jesus Christ, His Son. And that leads us to the next article, salvation only through Christ. We believe that salvation from sin comes by the grace of God alone, through the personal faith alone in Jesus Christ alone as the one who paid the penalty for sin on the cross. We believe salvation from sin can never be earned by good works. 
So this is an absolute affirmation of our belief that salvation is through Christ alone. This is a non-negotiable of being centrally involved and identified with the saints at Fort Collins Bible Church. We do not believe that you are saved or kept by your own good works, that no amount of good works, penance or uh, self-inflicted atonement or payment for sin could ever satisfy the ultimate righteous demands from God. But it is faith alone through Christ alone that saves. That is central to our understanding of what God's Word has to say and our life and actions here in the church. Eternal security. We believe that those who are saved from sin on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ alone are rescued forever from the penalty of sin and cannot again enter into condemnation. We believe that because salvation is entirely a work of God, that there is nothing that a human being, including yourself, could do to undo it, to ruin it, to take it away. In other words, as God has said that a person who's trusted in Christ has eternal life, if it could be broken, shaken, given back, it would not be any longer eternal. So on the basis of the Word of God and the Word of God alone, we recognize that once a person has trusted Christ, they are in an eternal relationship with the God of the universe on which He staked His name on the completion of that salvation. For the Holy Spirit, we believe that the Holy Spirit baptizes, indwells, and seals anyone who trusts in Christ alone for his or her salvation, and then continues to work in the life of the believer, leading him or her toward transformation into the image of Christ. We believe the Holy Spirit imparts spiritual gifts to believer, each believer for the edification of the body of Christ. That's a special, uh, unique hallmark of our church is the reliance upon moment-by-moment fellowship and gifting of the Holy Spirit in order for us to do the work which the Lord has set out for us to do. We believe in two ordinances of the church, being baptism. Believer's baptism is the immersion of a believer in water and is properly called believer's baptism. We believe believer's baptism, it serves as a picture of our death to sin, our own resurrection and a new life in Christ. We believe baptism in no way contributes to or offers salvation from sin. Baptism is a symbolic observation. It is not magical. It does not have superpowers. It is a symbolic expression of what has happened when a person trusts in Christ. They go down into the water as we're identified with Christ and baptized into Him, and we come out of the water to walk into newness, walk in newness of life. It's a picture of what had gone on, just like a wedding is only a celebration surrounding the core commitment that, uh, that is being made between two people. So baptism is the outward celebration of an inward spiritual truth. Similarly, the Lord's Supper, we believe that the Lord's Supper is the particular means Christ ordained for the assembly of believers to remember His death and to proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. By means of the symbols of the bread and the fruit of the vine, we believe that the Lord's Supper in no way contributes to or offers salvation from or forgiveness of sin. And this is another important point and feature of the of biblical doctrine is that there is no magic that happens in the Lord's Supper as we'll uh, celebrate it later today. It is the opportunity for us as the body to never get too far from the gospel of Jesus Christ and the hope of His soon return. It's an anchor point that reminds us as a body of what we truly believe and how we are saved by faith alone and Christ alone and it is all for His glory. Finally, about the end times, we believe that according to the Word of God, the next great event in the fulfillment of prophecy shall be the coming of the Lord and the heir to receive To himself, his church, we believe that Jesus Christ shall return in power and glory to judge the nations of the earth and set up his millennial kingdom. We believe in the bodily resurrection of believers to eternal life and the bodily resurrection of unbelievers to eternal punishment. So, this belief in the end times is codified importantly in our doctrinal statement because it is what gives us the ability to understand the times around us and the mission that we are meant to have. With this understanding the next thing in God's prophetic timeline is the rapture of the church and God's judgment of sin and establishment of the millennial kingdom tells us that our hope is truly in Christ alone and our business in this day is to share the gospel, the love of Christ and the good news of His salvation so that one fewer person would have to endure that coming time of judgment or the eternal punishment that would follow. So, 
We don't often do this, and uh, would, at some point in the future, we will hope to do another series, as we've done in the past, on the doctrinal statement. But it's important that we have that established, that we know where the church stands so that we can continue to grow and understand um, and be forthcoming about our beliefs. Uh, the saddest thing that has come about in the modern church movement, particularly with the desire to just get as many people as possible, right? Remove as many distinctives, remove as many true central beliefs and try to make it sound as generic and vanilla as possible, is that it sadly dooms believers to an eternal and continuing immaturity because they're, they're never confronted with anything that is controversial. And the Word of God's controversial. Absolutely. People say doctrine divides. Absolutely. What we believe divides us from non-believers. What we believe divides us from the cults and the heretics that reject the Word of God in whole or in part. What we believe really is meant to divide in a positive sense, and that's why we want to be forthcoming about what we believe, both in terms of our established written doctrinal statement as well as in our teaching over the pulpit. So that brings us to the mission statement, something that hopefully brings all that down to a simpler picture of what we're meant to be doing and how we want to order our priorities. So our mission statement reads as follows. It says, it is our aim to glorify God by growing to be a local church that is defined by biblical doctrine, is gospel-driven, exemplifies unconditional love, is theologically and practically oriented to God's grace, and is anticipating the final hope of Christ's return. So, does that get everything in our doctrinal statement? Absolutely not. But hopefully it gives us some broad umbrellas to continue to put before us so that when we ask, what is the church about, that we can answer, this is what our church is about. This is where we're headed. This is what we believe. This is where our priorities are and hopefully are reflected in how we live our lives. So, for the next five weeks, we're going to look today at what it means to be defined by Bible doctrine. We're going to look at uh, next week what it is to be gospel-driven. After that, what it means to exemplify unconditional love, and then what it is to be theologically and practically oriented to God's grace, and finally, to be a, live in anticipation of the final hope of Christ's return. So all of that is the next five weeks. So hopefully, we can come to a greater understanding and come to an increasing desire to apply these core values, this mission statement, to our lives. And that makes us start today by asking, what is the local church? There is incredible confusion as to what the church is. Church is an interesting word by itself and if we look at the history, but now we have churches all over, churches that are dedicated to biblical things, and we have the church, there's even a church of Satan actively working, and it is a uh, calling itself a church. And yet, when we think of what the church is, we might be tempted to think of it as a social club. It's a place to go meet people for folks who are bad at making friends, or maybe... <laughs> I mean, not you guys, but you know other people. Maybe it's a source of entertainment, right? We see this very frequently. A church is a place to go to get some source of entertainment, maybe a little bit of a, an emotional lift up and feel like we've you know, tithed our time to God or whatever it is, some source of entertainment where the lights and the smoke machine and the super inspiring charismatic leader can come up and impress us and wow us all and make us feel real, real good. Uh, others have thought that the church just is a salvation station. All it is is a, a, a launching point for the gospel that's getting people saved, getting people saved, getting people saved. That's our only hope and our only goal and our only reason for existence. However, none of these are accurate. While there are certain uh, realities to that, right? The church is a place where the body of Christ meets and is in uh, fellowship with one another. And in that sense, it satisfies many of, much of our, if not all of our social needs uh, to be in connection, deep and meaningful connection with others. Uh, there is a reality in which once we grow and become uh, invested in the things of God and the, word, the truth of God and the Word of God, that we are entertained by learning more about the God who loved us and gave His life for us. And obviously, part of the job of the church is to equip the saints to share the gospel so that every believer is ready and able to bear the word, or bear the word in the, of truth and salvation to anyone in your life. Because ultimately, the Lord has placed you in a context with people around you to share His love and His gospel, and it is part of the church's job to equip you to do that in a meaningful way. But we also want to point out that the church in the Bible has uh, two kind of different usages, and we've 
theologians, rather, you know, later have classified these or helped to understand these in terms of the universal church and the local church. And we'll understand this Venn, or explain this Venn diagram in a moment. But the universal church, very simply, is what you become a part of whenever you place your faith in Jesus Christ. When a person trusts in Jesus Christ, they are born again. They are made a part of the body and the bride of Christ. They are included in Christ in His destiny. You are made a part of what we call the universal church. Every believer is a part of the universal church regardless of whether or not or where you attend a local gathering. It is a part of that universal body that will be, uh, has been made and redeemed, has been cleansed and purified, and will rule and reign with Christ into the uh, millennial kingdom. You're a part of that group because you've trusted in Jesus. You're made a part of the universal church. But then also, the Bible talks about the local church, right? In each le- uh, letter you might get uh, read in the, in, the, in the Bible, in the epistles, epistles uh, Paul will write about to the saints at Galatia, to the church at uh, Ephesus, and so on and so forth. And so, we have local gatherings of believers, and you see so you have the local church and then the universal church. You become a part of the universal church by trusting in Christ. You become a part of the local church by showing up. Pretty easy, right? And we want to point out how you could be in any one of these circumstances, uh, and, or a human, rather, can be in any one of these circumstances. There's, first of all, the person who is not a part of the universal church nor a part of the local church, and they, we are rather shallowly indicating with this frowny face, right? Of course, they're sad. They might be happy. They might be sad emotionally, but this is the worst place a person could be after a fashion because they are outside of uh, knowledge of the Lord, they're outside of peace and forgiveness and life that is in Christ, and they're separated from an opportunity to hear about it. Possibly less sad is the person who goes to a local church but has not trusted Christ or salvation. They're not for salvation. They're not born again. They're not a part of the universal church. And tragically, being in a church doesn't make you a Christian any more than being in a garage makes you a car, as the saying goes. Is this person more sad or, or less sad? It would be difficult to say. Or is their, their situation more pitiable maybe or less? It, I, I, I wouldn't be comfortable saying. On the upside, they have the opportunity hopefully to hear the gospel, to hear the truth and be challenged with some regularity to abandon their own works and trust in the working of Christ, God alone through Christ alone for salvation. Nevertheless, not being a part of the universal church, just showing up for the local church is not meaningful at all in terms of gaining credit before God. So I would challenge you, if you're here today and no one can see into your soul and no one can judge, you could have me fooled every day for the rest of our lives together. But if you've not trusted Christ alone for salvation, do your business with God today. You can even fill out our articles of, of uh, you know, our membership covenant, meaningless. When you stand before the Lord, that one simple question, why should I let you into my heaven, has only one correct answer, and that is because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ for sin, because of His perfect payment. I, though unworthy, though sinful, though fallen, though ruined, though a wreck before you, have trusted in His gift of salvation and life. If you haven't made that deal with God, you don't need to come forward. You don't need to tell someone, although I would love to talk to you if you do make that that choice to trust in Christ. But please, don't be this person and don't operate under the foolhardy idea that God cares one whit that you showed up here today or at any other church. Well, it might seem to the benefit of the church to fill more seats, to say, hey, yeah, just come here and you get special status before God. It simply would not be accurate to the truth of God's Word. And your faith is what brings you to the universal church. So this fellow, the next fellow that we'll talk about, is a part of the universal church, but he's not or she's not going to any local church, right? This is a situation for many believers because they have no choice. They're uh, maybe stuck in stuck in their house for some medical reason or health reason or, or difficulty. There's other churches that are not able to gather as a local church because of the political situation or the social situation going on around them. Many opportunities, uh, tragically, where a person might legitimately be not a part of a local church. However, that's not most of the people's case most of the time. 
And oftentimes, right, because it's difficult to find maybe a body who you find totally acceptable or whatever, then there are believers who choose, uh, again, sorrowfully, to disconnect themselves from the local church and just feel that they're feeding themselves spiritually in private, even through good resources which the church has provided. And again, this person's saved, they know Christ, their salvation is not in question, but their growth is, a, is, is massively limited because they don't have the ability to apply the Word of God. I'll say this again. You cannot apply the Word of God apart from the body of Christ. It's what you're meant to be a part of. Just like we saw, Israel cannot... Um, Israel could not keep, or rather, we could not keep the law of Israel, or one individual Israelite could not keep the Mosaic law. It took the whole nation doing what they do. So similarly, we as believers today cannot fulfill the Word of God apart from the gathering of the local church. doesn't mean we'd lose salvation on that other end. It just means that we'd be limited in our ability to glorify God. So this is where the Lord wants you. See, we'll give Him a little red nose to show. That is exactly where the Lord would have you. First of all, and most importantly, in a relationship with Christ by faith through grace, and second of all, involved in a local church body, knowing people, serving people, loving people, using your spiritual gifts, learning the Word of God, and rubbing up against the difficulties of life with other people. It's how God has us designed. So that's our goal, is to be that, to be that local church family, to be that local church wherein we are able to use our gifts our spiritual gifts naturally and fully, wherein we are able to edify the body of Christ and prepare the saints to go out and do the work of ministry in whatever context the Lord might give you. That is our central goal. And what we're doing should always relate around to that goal. So then we ask the question, what is Bible doctrine? Well, the word doctrine is a funny word. We don't use it anymore, or at least very rarely. I think you might hear it in a, a military context now and again. Um, but the word doctrine can essentially be brought across as teaching. We'll look at that actually here. It says, <clears throat> Webster's Dictionary has uh, teaching instruction. He taught them many things by parables and said unto them in his doctrine, hearken, Mark 4.2. Uh, uh, also, the second definition is really what we're appealing to in this context, fascinatingly enough. It says, that which is taught, what is held, put forth is true and supported by a teacher, a school, a sect, a principle or position, or the body of principles in any branch of knowledge, any tenet or dogma, a principle of faith as the doctrine of atoms, the doctrine of chances, the doctrine of gravitation, Isaac Watts. So, I Watts, sorry. Um, uh, so, what we want to point out here is that this second definition of doctrine is what we're talking about, and that's why I like to continue using the word. We could just say Bible teaching, but that's easily confused with the verb or the act of teaching the Bible. And we're not defined, although as a function of reality, we are going to be found teaching the Bible often. We're not actually defined by the act of teaching the Bible, but by being dedicated to what the Bible teaches. And I hope we can see the difference between that. What we're dedicated to is not just the function or the verb of teaching the Bible, but to the, what we discern that the Bible is telling us in terms of what to believe, what to understand, and how to live, right? So we don't believe in Bible teachers, right? Or rather, we don't just believe something because a Bible teacher says it. We believe what the Bible says and what that's appropriate. And a Bible teacher fallible, might be wrong, might be mistaken, but the Word of God is never mistaken. It is infallible. So, it's our goal that what we do gets at directly at what the Bible says, and hopefully what the Bible says defines us as a body, what we believe, what we do, and what we say. So, we have to start at the outset and say, what do we believe the Bible is then? There's a lot of ideas uh, floating around, right? There are many, in fact, the most clever thing atheists can come up to attack Christianity with lately is, you believe your, your, what you believe is based on an ancient book, so it's all invalid. Like, that's not an argument at all. And yet, that's the best thing that they can come up with. Oh, what I believe is based on science. No, it's not, you goofball. But the reality is, is that, that we believe, what we believe the Bible is or what a person believes the Bible is, is going to help us understand exactly how we relate to it. And what we truly believe about the Bible is going to dictate how we respond to it. So at this church, we teach and believe that the Bible is 
inerrant. It means it is without error or inaccuracy in the original text. So that is to say, when God gave the original manuscripts through the hands of those whom He used to deliver it to us, it is the very outbreathed Word of God, and there was no error or inaccuracy. Since then, there have been generations and generations of copies made, and by the wonder of God's grace and protection and transmission of the text, we have thousands and thousands of Bible texts going to going back to within sometimes years of the New Testament documents. We have every reason to trust that we have every word of God as He intended us to have it and that there is no error in, uh, or inaccuracy in the, in the Bible, but only error in our understanding of the Bible. Here, Psalm 19.7 is a simple proof text for this. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Of course, Psalm 19 goes on to re uh, repeat and elaborate on this idea. But it is our conviction and understanding that the Word of God is entirely without error. Next, that it is inspired. It is uniquely delivered directly from the mind of God using human authors and delivering that's perfect and adequate message. We don't believe that the Word of God is inspiring or simply inspiring as many uh, will affirm today, but we believe that it is actually to the Word and to the letter what God would have us know as if breathed out by, right? Of course, God does not have lungs and lips, but God so closely wants us to identify this. He says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The word here is used, uh, means to breathe out, theopneustos, breathed out by God, <sighs> exhaled by God. And um, of course, there's an there's a anthropomorphism being used here, but he's pointing out that that's how God wants us to regard His Word as being His Word as not being a collection of essays, accounts, and ideas about who God might be, but an actual self-revelation who God wants us to know that He is. And then we would ask the simple question, but isn't that just what Christians do? I mean, goodness, isn't that what believers, isn't that what being a Christian is about, believing what the Bible says about Jesus, about God? About... And the tragic reality is, is that we do have to make this clear. Because many churches do not believe the Bible. They might affirm something positive about the Bible, but they will very frequently, either in their actual belief or just in their actions, d belie that belief and say otherwise. I'll give you just a quick example. I'm not, believe me, I'm not trying to pick on anyone. I just want to point out that there's some mainline denominations that, will, that are comfortable telling you they don't believe in the Bible. So, the Anglican Episcopal viewpoint is that it's inspired, but not inerrant. In other words, it comes from God, but it's certainly not perfect. So you get to decide, I guess, or maybe the theological minds above get to decide what really counts and what doesn't. Baptists have a tendency to be, in, and, and I want to make sure that we recognize this. These are official positions of councils of churches and so on and so forth. You will find individuals in these churches who believe any variety of things. So it doesn't mean that you meet an Anglican and you can say, oh, well, you don't believe in the Bible. Well, that particular Ang Anglican just might. You don't know. But I'm just pointing out from, for the position of these institutions of these large-scale denominations. Um, so, Baptists, inspired and inherent, right? Lutheran will have a tendency. Actually, this is right, uh, right out of the official documentation. Both the Lutheran Church of the Missouri Synod and the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, consider Scripture inspired and inerrant. All those other ones? No. Either not inspired or not inerrant. An important historical document, maybe, but not the central authority for life and faith and practice. Methodist, inspired, inspired and inerrant historically. Uh, Presbyterian, this is the Presbyterian. Now, again, be clear, there's hundreds and hundreds of different Presbyterian denominations or denominations that call themselves Presbyterian. This is the PCUSA, the Presbyterian Church of the United States of America, the largest and one of the most liberal denominations uh, available. But it says, for some, the Bible is inherent. For others, it is not necessarily factual but it breathes with the life of God. And this is a comfortable statement for them. We don't care what you believe about the Bible per se, as long as you understand that it's mildly important. The Roman Catholic position, God is the author of sacred, author of sacred Scripture, the divinely revealed realities which are contained and presented in the sacred uh, text of sacred Scripture have been written down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We must acknowledge that the books of Scripture firmly, faithfully, and without error teach that tr truth which God 
for the sake of our salvation, wished to see the confided to the sacred scriptures. Now, this is a great picture of how the catechism will very frequently, from our perspective, speak out of both sides of its mouth. They will affirm the truth of scripture, but then also in the same breath, affirm that the traditions and the rulings of the councils and, and so on, church history, are on equal footing. So, that's why we need to point this out. That's why we need to be clear. Because the reality is, is that we are not in the majority, even amongst those in Christendom, in affirming without question the reliability of the Bible. That is one of the things, the quintessential things that makes FCBC FCBC. And we're not totally alone. We're not the only church. But we are among a, a shrinking minority of believers or cr- people who call, will call themselves Christians but will not affirm the reliability and trust. Then we see the Bible abused even amongst um, churches that affirm the authority and inerrancy of the Bible. And they'll be abused by using an occasional proof text to lend authority to one speaking. So the pastor gives up, gives a wonderful 20-minute messages and closes, you know, his own thoughts, his own ideas, and then closes it with a verse of Scripture. That is an abuse of Scripture. That is essentially trying to hijack the authority of God's Word and then you know, kind of like tape it on to the end of my thoughts or whatever, the pastor's thoughts, the pastor's ideas, and that is unacceptable in the church of God. If the Word of God is the final authority, then you need to come not to hear how witty, how funny, how interesting, how smart, how clever any given pastor, Bible teacher, or preacher is. You need to hear the Word of God and the Word of God alone, not just tacked on or proof texted to lend a little authority. Uh, oftentimes we'll see the church or the Bible used just a little pick-me-up. In other words, used just for psychological purposes. It is uh, wonderful that as we behold the Lord through His Word, we do grow and we see positive psychological aspects, but it's not the point. The point is to know who God is and what He would have for us and not just seeking after the emotional pick-me-ups. The mystical method of Bible interpretation is abusive. In other words, nobody knows what the Bible says, so you have to come to me and God will mystically, magically reveal to me what it says. It's an absurdity. What the Word of God says and what the Spirit of God who lives within you as a believer and teaches you is objectively verifiable between you and I. So you can justifiably come up and say, I disagree with your interpretation or understanding of that passage, and you may well be right. There is no mystical, magical superpower given to uh, one Christian to ascertain what the Word is where another one can't have that same result. Finally, just the pastor's favorite parts. We see this very frequently, right? Instead of teaching verse by verse, word by word through Scripture, passage by passage, they just pick your favorite verses over and over and over again. So you're not letting the Word of God speak for itself, but just that small subsection of verses that the pastor or whoever is teaching likes to deal with. So these are all abusive ways in which the Bible is used very frequently throughout the church and certainly could be and undoubtedly has been at times even within these four walls. We need all to be attentive and fixated on the need for the Word of God. Why? Well, as First Tim- or, yeah, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 tells us, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I wanted you to note this, again, as we highlighted before, that the Word of God is breathed out. It is breathed out by Him, and then we find it's useful for, what's that word? Doctrine. Now, again, a lot of uh, a more modern translation, many will translate that teaching. It's not a bad translation, but what it Uh, again, removes or confuses or has the potential to confuse is that it might sound like it's just useful for the verb, the act of teaching, but really what it is, it is valuable for finding out what we're meant to believe, for reproof, for showing us where we are wrong, for correction, to show us how to move our beliefs and actions to be in line with the Word of God, and finally, for instruction and righteousness, for giving us the day-to-day needed instruction on how to live a righteous, godly life. Verse 17, often not included, is of the utmost importance, is that the man of God, this here is uh, Anthropos, it's uh, the person of God, if you're dealing with like a NASB 2020 or a NIV 2017, 2011, I think it is, then it'll say uh, man or woman of God, and that's 
accurate. That's acceptable because it is not talking about males here. It's talking about humans. The, 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 the man or woman of God may be complete. This word is often translated perfect. It means mature. The Word of God makes you mature as you absorb it, as you listen to it, as you believe it, as you let it replace the lies, the misconceptions, and the confusions of yourself. We gather together around the Word because it is that that makes us mature, is believing and trusting in what God's Word reveals that grows Christians to maturity, that, that makes us equipped for every good work. In other words, all the good things people think they're doing apart from a growing spiritual maturity are not good in the eyes of God, but are rather a huge waste of time. And we want to avoid that with our lives. We don't want to waste our time. So we gather around the Word of God so that our best efforts and our best ideas are not just wasted good intention, but rather causes us to grow and serve God as He would be served. Likewise, James 1, 21 says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted Word which is able to save your souls. Noting this idea of laying aside, walking away from all our life apart from Christ and now receiving regularly. Now, James is writing to believers. This isn't a verse about phase one salvation or about justification. This is a verse about growth. He's saying, Turn away from your sin nature and all that and receive instead with meekness, that is with humility or lowliness of mind, the implanted Word which is able to save your souls. He's not talking about salvation phase one. He's talking about being saved from the power of sin today. The Word of God, believing what the Word of God has revealed about your salvation in Christ, about Christ's power, about your resources in the Holy Spirit and in the body of Christ, that is what is able to free you, to liberate you from the tyrannical enslavement that we have to our sin nature. You need to learn what the Word of God says in order to become the mature believer that God would have you be. So then, in all practicality, how do we do this? We say, well, it's so simple. Don't we just read it? I mean, don't you just make sure that someone or another with a tie on gets up and talks about the Bible and then won't it happen? No, no, that's not nearly enough. We have to understand how we come to draw meaning forth from the Bible. And this is a very uh, simple and natural process. It's why we, in our doctrinal statement, we say we believe in the natural hermeneutic or the natural uh, Bible interpretation. And it essentially says and is based on this uh, presupposition that God, who invented language, is able and capable to communicate what He wants with that invention of language so that we can know and understand what He wants us to know and understand. Again, there's all sorts of uh, confusion surrounding the ideas of words and revelation, our ability to comprehend and understand, and in fact, part of this uh, world's assault on human intelligence or ability will say, oh, well, well, we'll never understand that. Well, that's true. There are things we will never understand. God is absolutely inscrutable and beyond our ability to fully comprehend, but we will absolutely have everything that we need to understand what He has given us in His Word. And so we do that, we, we lead that meaning out by um, this simple process. This simple process is designed to let God's Word speak for itself. Someone is, or many people have well pointed out, you can prove anything from the Bible. And they're absolutely right, as long as you don't read it naturally, as long as you only take a verse, as long as you take things out of context you can absolutely make the Bible say whatever you want. And that is a danger for Christians and non-Christians alike. It's so easy for us to want to manipulate the Word of God so that it says what we want to hear rather than listening to the Word of God and letting God tell us what He wants us to know and understand. So that's this process. We start by looking at Scripture and making observations about, uh, as we'll see, making observations about it so that we can uh, grow to gather all the facts, and then we come to an interpretation, that single interpretation, what does God want us to know in these verses, in this passage, and finally coming to an application. Now, each of these steps has sub-steps. So when we come to observation, we make observations in three major categories, language, history, and culture. 
God, as we saw and has spoken about, God gave us the word in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, and thus, that is why we expect our ministers to have a thoroughgoing background and an ever-growing uh, discipline of study in all the original languages, because those are the languages that God gave His word. Can you understand and know God through your translation? Absolutely. The Spirit of God is powerful and effective. But if we want to get down to the nuts and bolts and really understand in full you know, color and in full robustness of God's Word, then we need to be digging to go find out what did it mean in its original language and linguistic elements, its original historical context in which it was delivered, and finally in the original cultures that it was delivered that lent those words meaning. And so, when we go and talk about observation, we're going to be making a lot of observations. And it's why we are more than happy to show you every week how you make the sausages, as the saying goes. It's why we pull those things up is to let you know that this isn't just, you know, uh, Brad's affectation or someone's imagination or desire. This is digging into the true and, and, and as deep as possible into the text to think responsibly about it. And then once you get all those observations and you hopefully understand the, the linguistic and historical and cultural background, then you're able to start coming to interpretation that is settling back and deciding what it means, which means interpreting within context. So an under, understanding, first of all, what does that verse mean? In fact, sometimes we're going to break down to just a simple word. What does that word mean? What does that verse mean? And then we're going to say, what does that mean in the light of the passage that surrounds it? And then we'll go forward and say, what does it mean in the light of the book and the purpose that the book was written? And then we'll go out and say, what does that mean in the section of Scripture as it was written? What does that mean in light of the Testament, the New or Old Testament? Which are not great words, but it, it's fine. The New, which Testament? And finally, what does it mean in the context of the whole Bible? How does this all fit together systematically? How do we understand this in the, with the realization that the Bible will never conflict with itself? And then we come to application and we begin to ask, how does that apply? First of all, we ask, how does that apply to the people who heard it? We just had a long and intense uh, study through the Sermon on the Mount asking, what did this mean to the people who were sitting in front of Jesus? Because tragically, it so frequently gets misunderstood and mistaught because we move directly to, well, what does that mean to us today? Well, it doesn't mean the same thing to us today as it did to those who sat in the presence of Christ. There are uh, many similarities. But we have to understand who it, what it meant to the people who first received it before we can come to an understanding of what it means to us today. Now, there are multiple attacks that you may or may not be aware of on Bible study. Postmodernism is a way of thinking that's been actually affecting and infecting Western society forever. It's the idea that, you know, you have your truth and I have my truth, right? Oh, that's maybe that's true for you, but nothing's um, objectively absolutely true, an absolute refusal of absolute truth, which is kind of weird to think that they can say that absolute truth is absolutely untrue. However, this idea infects us in more ways than we know. And rather than coming to say, no, the Word of God is clear and we want to understand it, we say, well, this is what it means to me today or something to that like, which is not really bowing to the authority of God, but rather bowing to the authority of what we feel like in a given day. Neo-orthodoxy is uh, actually began at the beginning of the last century and is still affected. It's the idea that this is not the objective Word of God. It becomes the Word of God as you experience it. That's wrong. It's a lie. It is the objective Word of God. It is objectively true. It's historically true. It's scientifically true. It is factual and accurate in its every jot and tittle, and it is not made true by my belief in it, and it is not made false by my rejection of it. It is not made more true, and the meaning is not altered based upon the reader. Truth by feelings, emotion, and experiences are kind of subsets of that. In other words, I feel like this says this. Well, to be quite honest, it doesn't matter what you feel like the Bible says. It matters what the Bible says. Getting into the more insidious side, truth is defined by the pastor or the leader. Whatever the pastor says, that's what the Bible says. No, never. Spend all your time this week, I encourage you, to double-check every word that comes out of this pulpit. Double-check challenge, question, because truth is not defined by a pastor or a leader. The truth is defined by what is already given to us in the Word of God. And I have been wrong. I'll not try to. I will be wrong. Again, not on purpose, 
but because I'm fallible and, and just as failing as any of us. The power is in the Word of God, not in the leader or the person. Finally, the truth is defined by the denomination or organization, right? This is a very common idea. Well, we are a blank church, and therefore we believe this, this, and this. Let's never say that. Let's just never say that. We believe based on, and what we believe is based on the Word of God. And we don't hopefully ever appeal to the authority of the group, the denomination, or you say, well, we're non-denominational, so we're off the hook. Oh, no, we're not. We have groups of churches that we associate with. We have friends and people that we see things with. We have people that we line up with, whether that's, you know, schools or, or schools of thought or movements. And we can just as easily apply to, well, Lewis Berry Chafer said, or well, Ryrie said, or well, you know, this, that, or whatever, and rather than asking the simple question. It doesn't matter what the denomination says. It doesn't matter what the organization says. It doesn't matter what the group says or the clique says. It matters what the Word of God says. Finally, we fall into these attacks on Bible study and what's sometimes called the new hermeneutic, wherein it's suggested that you don't have to have any idea what the original context was. The Holy Spirit just tells you what you need to know about it. And that is, of course, absurdity in the highest degree. So, that is our conviction. So, what does that mean for us? It means that we're going to continue to read, preach, and teach the Bible. That is what we are going to do in response to this truth. Right? I just told you when we talk about our commitment to Bible doctrine is not just a commitment to teaching, but the function of that is that we need to get the Word of God out onto the table so that we can talk about it, so that we can question it, we let it challenge us. So we're going to continue to gather around the Word of God at every opportunity. I'm going to continue to challenge you, and I hope you're committed to reading the Bible on your own, to digging in, to seeking after study on your own, whether it's from, uh, again, other great Bible teachers, other great uh, extra-biblical studies, or, but most importantly, your own time and commitment to dedication to learning and studying the Word on your own. As your families, I hope you gather around the Word of God. That's an earmark of what it is to be a part of Fort Collins Bible Church. I hope you're involved in group studies, right? Whether that's the men's study, the women's study, the young adult study, the marriage study that we're doing, whatever it is that you gather together with other believers surrounding the Word of God. And finally, our corporate large gatherings, the same. Our Monday or Sunday night and Wednesday night service will always be centered around the Word of God because we are here to let the Word of God dictate our worldview beliefs and actions. Just as a final warning before we close, I want to note without any question, if the Bible conflicts with your feelings, your feelings are wrong. If the Bible conflicts with your desires, what you want to see or do, your desires are wrong and the Word of God is correct. If the Bible conflicts with the culture, the culture is wrong and the Word of God is correct and trustworthy. If the Bible Con, uh, conflicts with or appears to conflict with the government, the government's wrong and the Bible is correct. If the Bible co it conflicts with the media and what you're hearing, the media is wrong and the Bible is correct, the Word of God is correct. If the Bible interferes with the so-called science or conflicts with the so-called science, the science is wrong and the Bible is correct. At times, this is going to be uncomfortable. At times, this is going to bring challenges. This world has moved from a mild acceptance of the biblical worldview to toleration, to open rejection, and now we hover on the border. Actually, we've entered into open persecution against anyone who's willing to take a stand on the truth of God's Word. And anyone might lose a job or become uh, the focal point of various satanic and worldly attacks for saying such simple biblical statements as men are men and women are women, or any sex outside of marriage is sinful, or marriage is between a man and a woman, or abortion is murder. Whatever else these statements can be, they're so offensive to the word, or homosexuality is a sin for that matter, they could get you canceled, they could get you fired, they could even get you killed by the maddened, psychotic Satan possessed worldlings who are enslaved to it. That doesn't mean we need to build up a bitterness or an anger surrounding this, but rather with all compassion to know that these people are enslaved to those worldly viewpoints, to, to speak up all the louder with truth and love the reality of the, of the worldview given to us by the Word of God, that we are sinful, that we are fallen, 
and that Jesus Christ, the righteous one, has come as the Son of God to save us from our sins by His death upon the cross. And we don't back down one inch when it comes to declaring the Word of God. If that means open persecution, rejection by our culture, or anything else, we unapologetically stand upon the Word of God and its absolute truth, regardless of the results here in this life. Let's close our study with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, how we praise You and how we thank You for Your wonderful Word, Your truth revealed to us. It's hard sometimes for us to face the reality of what You've done and what You've given us, of the, our failures, of Your revelation, of the humility that it takes to come before You and recognize that we are hopelessly needful and You are always gracious and giving, forgiving us through the person and work of Your Son, Jesus Christ. Give us the wisdom and humility which we lack to humble us before your, ourselves before your word, to desire to know you above all things. Let us release our desire to be right and cling to the truth and reality that you are always right. Give us the wisdom to love your word as the revelation of yourself and your son. Give us the courage to speak your word and to speak your truth in an ever-darkening world, with grace and with love, with courage and compassion. Please, O oh Lord, be glorified in this one tiny local church. Amidst your whole great universal church that's spread throughout this world, be glorified in us, O oh Lord. Give us the wisdom to rightly respond to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.